How the Power of Your Mind Work by Pastor Chris Pulling down strongholds were at war One of the key ideas that has emerged from our conversation thus far is the fact that our words and deeds are influenced by our prevailing beliefs. Now you'll find yourself saying and doing dreadful things you never thought you could say or do if you don't stop and control your thoughts. That is as a result of the devil constantly attacking your mind. He's constantly trying to undermine and defile your mind so he can make you incapable of dealing with spiritual matters and ineffectual. The Bible clearly demonstrates that we are constantly engaged in spiritual combat, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. 2 Corinthians 10-3 For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places Ephesians 6 12. However, it also informs us that we have been given divine weapons that guarantee our victory. However, it also informs us that we have been given divine weapons that guarantee our victory, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10 to 4 minus 5 You'll notice that Paul here was talking about mental activities, including strongholds, fantasies, thoughts, and every high thing, suggesting that our minds are the scene of spiritual combat. Strongholds, imaginations, thoughts, and every high thing strongholds, in the context in which it's used in 2 Corinthians 10-4, isn't talking about a fortified physical structure or some external force the devil stirs up against you. It's referring to ideas, theories, imaginations, reasonings, beliefs, etc. Contrary to God's word that attack and capture people's minds, causing them to think, act, and respond in a certain way and, consequently, holding them back from enjoying their inheritance in Christ. Strongholds can also be ideas that have been ingrained in your mind as a result of your upbringing and background. They develop as a result of the things you've observed, heard, and experienced as well as the character traits and habits you developed prior to or even after you underwent rebirth. They might also be societal norms that are recognized and acknowledged as cultural and traditional values, but all they do is stop you from having fresh insights from God. In essence, strongholds are mental walls of containment that prevent people from advancing in the things of God. A person can believe, for instance, that I'm never going to succeed because both his grandfather and his father before him fail. Another adds, every time anything fantastic is going to happen to me, all hell breaks loose and I miss my moment, since that's how it used to be for him. These are fortifications, additionally casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians 10-5 this is a reference to erroneously elevated systems of philosophy, religion, ethics, and other ideologies put out by men to challenge and fight the knowledge of God. These are erected mental walls in people's brains to prevent them from knowing God. Vain, unjustified opinions, dogmas, mindsets, prejudices, superstitions, and beliefs. But praise be to God, who has protected us with a fortifying armor and rendered us immune to these demonic assaults on the mind. The Bible reveals that we have been given powerful tools by God that enable us to dismantle every idea and cast down every fantasy that has been put into our heads. Satan, to bring down everything that is lofty and exalts itself above the understanding of God, and to enslave all thoughts to follow Christ. Hallelujah. We may use our weapons to rescue men who have been held captive by these demonic ploys. The protection of God. We've established that, whether we like it or not or are even aware of it, we're in a battle with demonic powers. And because it's a spiritual battle, we can only use spiritual weapons to confront the foe 2 Corinthians 10-4. In Ephesians 6 13-17, Paul itemizes the different parts of our formidable and impregnable armor. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with pulling down strongholds truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, so here's what our armor consists of, 1. The belt of truth, 2. The breastplate of righteousness, 3. The boots of preparedness of the gospel, 4. The shield of faith, 5 the helmet of salvation, and six, the sword of the Spirit. If you examine each of these weapons attentively, you'll see that all but one, the sword of the Spirit, is a defensive weapon used to defend against attacks. Now, the KJV translation of the 16th verse can be a little deceptive. It seems to imply that the shield of faith is the last and most crucial part of the Christian's armor when it states, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the flaming darts of the wicked, the shield of faith would have been named last, according to an insightful remark by W. J. Knivere. But Paul went on to include two more pieces of the armor following the shield of faith. 
So instead of above all, Kanibir says, dot 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 take up to cover you the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one Ephesians 6 16. The Amplified Bible renders it thus, lift up over all the shield of saving faith, upon which you can quench all the flaming missiles of the wicked. Paul makes an intriguing comparison between the Christian's armor and the armor worn by Roman soldiers in this sermon. The word shield in this context, thurios, refers especially to the shield carried by the highly equipped Roman troops. It wasn't the relatively modest, round shield, but a massive, four by two and a half foot, rectangular one. The fire dart, an arrow with a pitch dip tip, was one of the most lethal weapons used in ancient combat. The flaming arrow was fired at the adversary as the pitch-soaked rope was set ablaze. To counter this, the Roman soldier handed it to the arrow, which was quenched when it sank into the shield while totally concealed beneath or behind it. In order to prevent the fiery darts of the evil one from entering any other area of your armor in the first place, Paul was suggesting that your shield of faith should be large and powerful enough to cover and guard every part of you. So arm yourself with your shield of faith and let it to totally shield you from the evil one's scorching arrows. These burning thoughts that the devil shoots at people's minds have shattered lives and families, destroyed businesses, started wars, and ravaged entire countries. But you can and should stop every dart the enemy throws at you with your shield of faith. Overthrowing the reasonings of the disputer 2 Corinthians 10-3 says, For the weapons which I wield are not of fleshly weakness, but mighty in the strength of God to overthrow the strongholds of the adversary. Thereby can I overthrow the reasonings of the disputer and pull down all lofty bulwarks that raise themselves against the knowledge of God and bring every rebellious thought into captivity and subjection to Christ. What weapons do you employ to destroy the enemy's strongholds? The Bible is God's word, the sword of the Spirit. Keep in mind that we only have one attacking weapon at our disposal. Glory to God. Those mental walls founded on the false things you've heard and believed all your life come tumbling down like the walls of Jericho when you ponder, murmur, and proclaim God's word. This is why I enjoy teaching and preaching the Bible, as I do. The false beliefs that men have been harboring for a long time as well as the pagan customs and traditions that they have based their lives and societies upon crumble under the weight of God's word. What about the disputants' arguments? With the sword of the Spirit, you destroy those as well. Satan is the one who challenges God's word. In the garden, Satan approached Eve and questioned God's word after he had told Adam not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil Genesis 3-1, 6. As a result, Eve was tricked. Even now, he still behaves in the same manner. For instance, the Bible states that you were healed by Jesus stripes 1 Peter 2 24, but the devil will challenge you by saying, come on, do you think you were really healed? Why do you still experience pain if you were there? You see, by using his unfavorable arguments and advice, Satan will try to undermine what God has said and rob you out of your blessings. With the sword of the Spirit, however, you can defeat them all, and as Kinnebear's translation of Ephesians 6 13 states, having defeated them all, stand unshaken. Hold your ground, resist the devil, and stake your claim to your inheritance in Christ as you declare God's word. Nothing the devil throws at you can get through your armor, and you are able to attack him and overthrow his strongholds by using the sword of the Spirit. God be praised. How to control positive thoughts and emotions. We stated that processing feelings and emotions is one of the functions of the mind in our definition of it. This specifically relates to varying degrees of passion, disaffection, and attachment. You can show someone or something more or less affection. Affection or disaffection can exist, then, you may also have strong feelings for or against. All of them are works of the mind. Don't manufacture worry and pain Nehemiah 8.10. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord, neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The part of this I want you to observe is where he says, Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The KJV incorrectly renders the phrase neither be you sorry. The Hebrew word for sorry. Otsep, meaning to carve, manufacture, or fashion anxiety, agony, rage, discontent, grief, hurt in the English translation. Nehemiah was essentially urging Israel, don't process, produce, or manufacture these unpleasant sensations and emotions of concern, sorrow, rage, discontent, sadness, or hurt, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah was looking at them being strong and not weak, successful and not failing, prosperous and not wanting. These were his main concerns. He therefore warned them against creating anxiety or suffering because doing so would undermine and ultimately destroy them. God wants you to be strong in the strength he has provided for you because the joy of the Lord is your strength. If not, he cannot utilize you. Be strong and extremely courageous, he commanded Joshua Joshua 1-7. And Nehemiah now informs us that strength is found in the pleasure of the Lord. Because of this, if the devil wants you to disobey God, he will pursue your joy. He will work to prevent you from being cheerful and make you blame those around you for your negative sentiments and emotions. 
If he is successful, you will discover that you are continuously disturbed and angry because someone is constantly wronging, hurting, or bothering you. After that, you create an attitude. But in reality, you're weakening spiritually because you let the devil take the Lord's joy, which ought to have been your source of strength. If the Lord commands you not to generate, fabricate, process, or manufacture pain, irritation, grief, or concern, he is letting you know that these emotions have no control over you until you replicate or process them in your mind. You are a manifestor of God's righteousness, a revealer of God's light, and a giver of God's goodness. Avoid letting Satan's character show through you. God said to Joshua, I am with you wherever you go. I will not fail nor forsake you. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. And no man shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. But this one thing I require of you. Be strong and very courageous. Joshua 1 to 5 minus 7. The Lord is calling on you to have great strength and courage, just like Joshua did. But how will you become strong? The pleasure of the Lord, which is reflected in singing, laughing, dancing, words of praise, and the loving harmony you have with your brothers and sisters in the Lord as you speak words of encouragement to them, gives you the strength you need. Avoid dwelling on negative sentiments and emotions like pain, annoyance, concern, and similar ones. Avoid setting yourself up for failure. Don't focus on your failure or the people attempting to cause you harm. Don't focus your thoughts on their unfavorable, offensive, or divisive remarks. You have God's nature because he gave birth to you. You should think and behave like he does since he made you in his image. You are a representative of God's righteousness, his light, and his goodness. You are also a child of God. So don't allow anything get to you. Don't let the devil's nature come through in you. Because of anything wrong they did to you, you might have proclaimed someone persona non grata and resolved to never speak to them again. However, such a mindset is incompatible with God's character. We don't make enemies in our kingdom. They can call us their foes, but we only make friends. The Bible says, God commendeth his love towards us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us Romans 5-8. Take on a Christ-like mindset. Before you pardon and speak to the offender once more, don't wait for him to apologize. Act instead like God, who shows his love to sinners even while they are unaware of him. Even if they hate and mistreat you, show people your love. You'll always be content if you let the righteousness of God to flow out of your spirit. React spiritually rather than emotionally. Although those around you could be reacting emotionally adversely, you must learn to react spiritually. Your spirit and mind should be un- That's why Paul tells us by the Spirit, be renewed in the spirit of your mind Ephesians 4.23. We've learned from Romans 12-2 how to transform our lives with our minds, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, and acceptable, and perfect, will of God. This was one of the first passages I was given as a young Christian and one that I memorized while growing up in church. It states that it is your duty to refresh your thoughts. Also note that it goes farther than simply advising you to have your mind renewed in order to undergo transformation. It goes on to inform you that you will demonstrate what is God's good, acceptable, and perfect will by renewing your mind. Read this verse out slowly and reflect on it. It is God's word, and it is intended to change your life. Let only your best qualities shine through. If you ever catch yourself being surprised by a negative mood or attitude, promptly apologize to yourself. Say, Father, I had no idea I could get so impatient. In the name of Jesus, I renounce impatience starting today. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I reject this if you find yourself responding to someone or something with wrath, rage, or bitterness rather than with love. It won't be able to control me. Don't allow anything or anyone to bring out your worst. Avoid displaying such ungodly characteristics. Refuse to allow evil expressions to find a vent in your life. I enjoy the song that says, Satan has no authority here in this place. He has no authority here, for this abode was fashioned for the presence of the Lord. No authority here, because it is true. One of those tunes that you can sing and it will make your life go in the correct path is this one. You are the Lord's dwelling place, created for his presence. Satan therefore has no influence on any aspect of your life. Say no. Whenever you feel the want to explode in rage, I'm awash with love. After then, you tell the fury that it has no power over you since you are the Lord's abode and were made for his presence. Glory to God. When you do that, the love of God will abound and fill your heart. Do not think. Paul the Apostle revealed one of the special advantages and benefits of mind control in his epistle to the Philippian church. He wrote, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus Philippians 4-6-7. The word careful is translated from the Greek word merimnau, and it means to take thought or to be anxious about. That's why the New King James Version and several other translations render Philippians 4-6 as be anxious for nothing. The Amplified Bible translation of the same verse says, Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. 
All the time, we have thoughts. Even as you read this book, your mind may be processing many thought signals that are arriving through it. You might be considering a wide variety of topics and things, including the past, the future, upcoming work, a business deal, your spouse's birthday, your kid's soccer practice, a dream you had, etc. Your mind may be overrun by a torrent of ideas at any given moment, but you get to choose which one you want to focus on. You never know what an idea will do to or in you when you ruminate on it. To take thought is to focus your attention on something so that you become concerned. It frequently refers to having a notion that distracts us from what ought to be our main attention. Because of this, we are cautioned the Lord Jesus gave us the same charge in. Matthew 6 25 27 Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? Notice the phrase take no thought. It's from the same Greek word merim now rendered as be careful in Philippians 4-6. The Lord Jesus asked them, How many of you have increased in size or added to your years since you started taking thought? He was letting them know, You don't get better by worrying. Let's read on. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin, and yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or, What shall we drink? Or, Wherewithal shall we be clothed? Matthew 6 28 32 these are the issues that people around the world are focused on. Their entire existence revolves around what they're going to buy, wear, eat, drink, drive, spend, etc. They worry about getting all of these things in order to be content in this world. However, the Lord Jesus commands us not to be like them and explains why. He says, dot 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 for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things Matthew 6 32. Alternatively said, don't worry about these things, for your Father understands that you need them. Be like the avian creatures that take no consideration for their food but are continuously provided for by your heavenly Father. Then, in the next verse, he shows us what to give our attention to. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6 33. To see the establishment of God's kingdom and the manifestation of his righteousness in your world should be your top priority. Instead of concentrating on building your own comfort, fulfillment, enjoyment, and happiness, let God's kingdom be your main priority. You should be thinking about this constantly. Let Jerusalem enter to your consciousness. Jeremiah commanded Jeremiah 51, 50. Let the spiritual aspects of the kingdom take precedence in your thinking. Think spiritually, not carnally. Some Christians constantly think in terms of the flesh rather than the spirit. They are constantly worried about how other people will see them and exclusively focus on their material wealth, fame, positions, and ties to the earth, according to T.L. Osborne, folks who are preoccupied with what other people think of them are the slaves of the last person they spoke to. What a fact. Such folks carry a heavy load of striving to appease others. Instead of trying to impress people, be more concerned about pleasing the Lord. So, take no precautions, but make all of your requests known to God in prayer and petition with thankfulness. Simply express your desires to Him. He is able to handle them and is well aware of your present and future circumstances. Praise God. When you adopt this perspective, you'll see that fretting about anything is pointless. A spiritual principle and a guaranteed outcome. There's something about that admonition in Philippians 4-6-7 I want you to notice. It comes with a promise. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It states that your heart and mind will be under the protection of God's peace, which is beyond all comprehension. This is a spiritual principle that always produces the desired results when used. Recognize that there are spiritual laws that are analogous to the physical laws of gravity, electricity, physics, magnetism, and the like. Additionally, spiritual laws work just as reliably as physical laws when you comprehend them and follow them. The underlying idea is that when you give your demands to the Lord in prayer and petition while giving thanks, without giving them any thought, God's peace will guard your heart and mind. The wisdom of God is revealed in His written word, which is His mind and words. You reach the point where living the supernatural life is effortless when you learn to think like God by contemplating His word. Now you see why Jesus tells us to take no thought. It's because there are spiritual laws that you must violate regardless of what occurs. Even when difficulties arise and mental strain builds, you command, No, in the name of Jesus, I refuse to be worried or anxious. Glory to God, I announce and confess that I am a success. 
One of the many advantages of regulating your thoughts in God's way is that you'll have a heart and mind that are at peace and free from anxiety. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe for more like it. Thanks for watching.